Well, good evening. We are going to continue that same theme, what was preached last Wednesday, and that is covering this phrase, calling on the name of the Lord. Really, if you want to be even more specific, it's calling on the name of Yahweh, as uh, Christians have uh, called him in the past as well, Jehovah. Jehovah's Witnesses, as the cult group, they do not lay claim on that name. It's unfortunate how they've taken it and dragged it through the mud with their false doctrine. Uh, but Jehovah is what Christians of generations ago mainly, some still hold to that, and you'll see, read uh, hymns with the name Jehovah in it. Uh, when you read capital L-O-R-D in your English Bible, that is where it is being uh, said there, it is the sacred name of God, transliterated or translated as best we can, uh, Jehovah or Yahweh. That is what scholars in our generation think is a little bit more accurate to the original Hebrew. But no matter, as long as we understand, it is calling on the name of the Lord, the covenant-keeping God, the unchanging God. Uh, that's what we want to consider tonight. And we are going to go to 1 Kings 18. We are jumping ahead. 1 Kings 18. In my study, it jumps from Isaac all the way over to 1 Kings 18. Now, is there phrases to calling on God? Probably, yeah. Most definitely. Um, so the act of calling on God, uh, that is for sure in between uh, Genesis where we left off last week and 1 Kings. It, it surely is. But uh, as I started out this series, we wanted to, to simply look at those passages with this specific phrase. And so the next reference is 1 Kings 18. Um, if, if you do your study and, and you see something different, if uh, Logos, I, I misread it or something like that in the search, uh, you bring that to me, because then next time I preach, we'll go backwards. I want to make sure to cover every reference to this. But yes, jumping all the way to Elijah. Well, in 1 Kings 18 here, we're going to read verse 24, though we're going to get the larger context to better understand how this is being used. Here, Elijah is speaking to the prophets of Baal. And he says... And you call upon the name of your God, and I will call upon the name of the Lord, of Yahweh. And the God who answers by fire, he is God. And all the people answered, it is well spoken. So we, of course, need to dig into what is going on here. <laughs> we want to know the context of this. So we're going to take some time uh, going outside. We're going to have to take a real big step back. To, to help bridge the gap between Isaac, who we talked about last week, up to Elijah here. I think that would be profitable. Um, but there are some main themes in, in this use of this act, calling on the name of the Lord. Two main themes to come out of this text. I want you all to keep this in mind as we go through it together. One is that calling on the name of anyone else is ultimately empty. Futile, you fill in the blank, uh, pointless. And if it's preferred over calling on the name of the Lord, like these false prophets were, looking to Baal, the false god Baal, uh, it is very sinful. It is ultimately foolish. But secondly as well, this passage shows us how we can call on the name of the Lord and how he delights to answer we're going to read what Elijah actually says as he does call to the name of the Lord. You know, he says he's going to do it. That's what we just read. Well, some verses later, he does, he does it. And we actually read what he says. We haven't been able to do that in the other passages we've looked at yet. It says that the generation of Seth, godly people in that generation, they called on the name of the Lord. We don't know exactly what they said. Same with Abraham. Same with Isaac. In those specific references, we don't have any quotes from them. Well, here we have Elijah in detail saying what he, uh, he says, recording what he has said. Uh, so that should be profitable for us when we consider those two things. 
the similarities between this occurrence and previous ones, well, it's in a time of difficulty. Just like in the generations of Seth, in generation, uh, Genesis 4, uh, in Abraham's life, Genesis 12, in Isaac's life, uh, they all called on the name of the Lord in a time of difficulty, in a time of uncertainty, where they were tempted to fear. They were, they were brought to their end, and they needed to cry out. They realized they needed help. Well, Elijah is similar in, in a certain sense here, but we can see that Elijah has this settled confidence in the Lord as well. It, it is very clear from this passage. Uh, and we see this in contrast. We see this as he faces these false prophets, these false prophets of Baal. To understand what happened in between Isaac and, and Elijah here, we need to, need to take a, a little survey. Uh, we need to consider how those promises that were given to Abraham and to Isaac, what we covered last week, how they have been starting to be fulfilled by the time of Elijah. And what's happened in between? Well, the promises for offspring, you have the patriarchs coming from Jacob, otherwise known as Israel. His name was later changed. He was given a new name. They become a nation, a whole nation. They leave Egypt. They inherit the land. They take possession of Canaan, where Abraham and Isaac were sojourning, pitching their tents and never actually getting possession of the land. Israel has gotten it. And yet, they have not driven out all the pagans, all the Canaanites, as they should have. They made alliances, they got lazy, they were fearful, various reasons for various tribes. And so this ungodly influence remained in the land. There has been a kingdom set up in between this time, by the time of Elijah. And not only has there been a kingdom set up with a king, but by Elijah's time, the tribes have actually separated. So Saul united the tribes. We can read about him in 1 Samuel. Um, and then David comes, and uh, he is able to, to bring together all of them as well. And he actually sets up the kingdom that, that God ultimately purposed his heart for. He blesses David in a unique way that he never does bless Saul. It expands the kingdom out. They conquer more of the land. And he gives a promise. You know, we add on to these, these beautiful promises God gives his people. He gives a promise to David that one of David's sons would always reign on the throne. You read about that in 2 Samuel 7. Uh, I believe it's 2 Samuel 7, yeah. I always get the uh, uh, First Chronicles passage mixed up with that. And you have this promise looking to be fulfilled by King Solomon, David's son. And at this point, he is drawing the nations in. He's blessing the nations. The Queen of Sheba is coming. And it seems like Israel has everything that God has promised. It doesn't seem like it could get any better in the days of Solomon. At least it appears that way. Yes, Zechariah, you had your hand up. Well, he never he never makes a, 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 a he never ultimately goes back on his promise for the Davidic line, uh, not ultimately. Um, is there a, is there a specific thing you're thinking of? Oh yes, yeah no this this was before uh, yeah that that. Uh, with, with the last kings of Judah, I believe that's done with. Yes, yes. Um, yeah, because David ultimately has multiple sons. So, uh, No, this was before. He, he, does, he gives a, just a general promise that he would have a son that is to reign on the throne forever. That, that's kind of the, the foundational promise. Yeah, there's things that happen. Psalm 89, you could read that as well. There, there's, there's complexity to that. Uh, but ultimately... There's that promise that stands. There's a son that's going to come and always sit on the throne. 
But with Solomon's, uh, at Solomon's peak, he becomes proud, sinful, and things start falling apart. And then we have a renting of the kingdoms. First Kings deals with this. And now you have the ten tribes to the north and the two tribes to the south, Judah and Benjamin. Um, and, and, I, and Simeon's kind of been swallowed up there. And you have the other tribes in which these, there, there's a war. There's two different kings now. Uh, Ahab is a king to the north. We go down some generations here and we read about this king he is not a godly man. None of the kings of the north ultimately were. No, not at all. Only the south. Uh, the north, they, they do what they want. <laughs> uh, Jeroboam, the first king to the north, he creates two calves. And one at the north, northest point of Israel. One at the most south, right by the border of Judah. And he says, don't go to the temple down in Judah. Come worship God by worshiping these two calves. And that is how they've worshipped Yahweh right up to the time of, of Ahab. Uh, they create their own pre priest system. It's really just a copycat religion of the true worship of God. It mirrors it in ways, but it's a complete farce. So the northern kingdom, right from the start, they were astray. Um, and no king is ultimately called godly here. But... We read about the, the height of the wickedness here in the northern kingdom. I want you to turn back to 1 Kings 17. This is how I'm going to give us some context to that verse about calling on the name of the Lord. And as you do that, I'm going to turn on this fan. I feel very warm in here. Yes, very appropriate. The north is heretical, very much so. Uh, yeah, you have to imagine when that happened and the north says, we don't want anybody going to the temple. What are the godly people in the north going to do? They're, they're going to say, okay, well, I'm moving down to Judah, I guess. I am not going to stick around here. So yeah, the northern kingdom very early was left with a lot of ungodly people. So, and... Uh, I'm sorry, it's 1 Kings 16, I apologize. 1 Kings 16, 29. So right before chapter 17, right near the end of chapter 16. So we read here, In the 38th year of Asa, king of Judah, that's the southern kingdom, Ahab, the son of Omri, began to reign over Israel. So the northern kingdom. And Ahab, the son of Omri, reigned over Israel in Samaria, that's their capital, 22 years. And Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord, more than all who were before him. And as if it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. Pause there. Remember how I said Jeroboam was the first king? He created those two calves. And that's how they worshipped God. That's how they sought to worship the true God with these idols. That is the sin of Jeroboam. So Ahab was all on board with that. But not only that, he took for his wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Sidonians, a pagan neighbor country, and went and served Baal and worshipped him. He erected an altar for Baal in the house of Baal, which he built in Samaria. And Ahab made an Asherah. That's another idol. We'll, we'll talk about who Baal and Asherah were. Ahab did more to provoke the Lord, the God of Israel, to anger than all the kings of Israel who were before him. And then uh, the writer goes on and says, in his days, somebody tried to build Jericho again, and uh, it cost them their ch children's lives. And that's what Joshua had he'd cursed the building of Jericho says that would happen. If somebody tries to do it, it happens. So it shows you that it's a messed up time for these tribes. Yes? In verse 33, uh, made a Yeah, I'll explain what a grove or a pole or the Ashra idol is. I'll explain that, yeah. Yeah, that's how they worshipped um, uh, Asherah or Ashtaroth or... Atan. There's a, there's a few goddesses there. 
Ruthie, you had your hand up back there. Do you have a question? Go ahead, sweetheart. Why did Ahab take Jezebel? We don't really know why, but kings back then, they liked to marry other princesses to make uh, kind of like friendship with other kings. So he wanted to work with this ungodly country. So he said, if I marry their daughter, then they won't hurt my family. Our families will be friends. We can work together. But that's not a kind of working together God wants his people to do. So Ahab married an ungodly woman. May the Lord keep you from ever becoming like Jezebel. Okay? You don't want to follow her. No, no. Or Ahab to the, to the men and the, the boys here. Now we read in uh, 1 Kings 17, the next chapter. Who comes on this scene? Now Elijah the Tishbite of Tishbe and Gilead, said to Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives, before whom I stand, there shall be neither dew nor rain these years, except by my word. This is significant. You know, we have the setting here. Here comes the challenge. Elijah, with the Lord's blessing, approaches the king and says, There's going to be a drought and there ain't going to be any rain for the nation until God, through me, says so. It's quite a bold claim to come up to the king and say that. And it is extremely significant that of all the things God uses as a consequence, it's drought which the Lord here uh, puts in place. It's rain which he withheld. Now, he promises to do that to disobedient Israel. You read about that under the Old Covenant. But it's actually quite significant because Baal was the storm god. He was the god who brought the rain. He was the god that these Canaanites looked to for good crops and for fertility and so forth. And that's no doubt why these Israelites were turning to him. They were trusting in him, this, this false god, not really a him, but you know the demons behind him, this idea of Baal, rather than trusting the one true living God. And when God says this, it is him declaring, Baal has no power over the storms, he has no power over the rain, he's no rain god, storm god, he's no god. Who is the true god? Who has real power here? He's making quite a statement with this. Uh, we're not given too much information on how demons can alter the weather or not. We know in Job, when God gives permission to Satan to go do things to Job, I mean, wind gust kills his family. Um, but, you know, what, what's the interplay between God and, and the demons doing things? We don't fully know. But ultimately, God's in control of it all. That's what we can rest in. Yeah, yeah. He's the first cause, ultimately. So... Elijah sets this challenge, and we have an account in the rest of this chapter about how God preserves Elijah during this time, how he ministers to a widow. Just for our purposes tonight, we're not going to go through Elijah's life, though I'd encourage you to read this. We're going to fast forward many days later, as chapter 18, verse 1 says. After many days, the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, so it's been three years of drought, saying, Go show yourself to Ahab, and I will send rain upon the earth. Well, there's an occasion where he meets with a, a, a God-fearing servant of Ahab. There's a conversation here, but I do want us to, to kind of move forward to verse 17, because this is when he actually stands in front of Ahab. And this is where the scene really picks up. When Ahab saw Elijah, this is verse 17, Ahab said to him, is it you, you troubler of Israel? And he, that's Elijah, answered, 
I have not troubled Israel, but you have, and your father's house, because you have abandoned the commandments of the Lord and followed the Baals. Now therefore send and gather all Israel to me at Mount Carmel, and the 450 prophets of Baal, and the 400 prophets of Asherah, who eat at Jezebel's table. She's a queen. She had a table. Big table, fancy food. So these, these false prophets were very close with her. These were the main prophets that, that Ahab consulted. Uh, when, when we read how Ahab did not merely worship God in the wrong kinds of ways, like the former kings of Israel did, but he started worshiping Baal now, uh, what, what is being said is he's, he's preferring Baal. Uh, he's setting up he set up a temple for Baal. Uh, we read later here that he has killed, him and Jezebel have killed and persecuted the true prophets of God. The prophets that are saying, no, no, you should not worship Baal. We're not going to work with these false prophets. In place he has yes men who call themselves prophets of Yahweh, but are truly no prophets. They're false prophets. But Elijah here makes the challenge. He says, Get all the people together. Get your prophets together. Meet me at Mount Carmel. Well, what's going to happen? We keep reading. So Ahab sent to all the people of Israel and gathered the prophets together at Mount Carmel. And Elijah came near to all the people and said, How long will you go limping between two different opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people did not answer him a word. So we have here at this scene, Ahab. He's undecided in some ways. He's surely chosen a sinful path. His heart's not with the Lord. But you read about this man's life and you see he's conflicted about things. He seems uh, he's, he's quite timid. Ultimately, Jezebel's wearing the pants in his relationship. It's pretty clear when you study these two. Um, but he is there. He is curious, no doubt, what is going to happen here. That's why he lets it all happen. You have these prophets of Baal who have gathered. They're utterly convinced that Baal is the one they should devote themselves to. And then you have all the people of Israel, at least as many as were gathered there. No doubt other leaders and elders and so forth. And they're just lukewarm in every sense. They're not ready to commit themselves to, to much of anything, it seems. They're very finicky, very fickle in who they choose. But here's the scene. And of course, you have Elijah, utterly convinced he must devote himself to the Lord. Uh, verse 22, Then Elijah said to the people, I, even I only, am left a prophet of the Lord. But Baal's prophets are 450 men. Let two bulls be given to us, and let them choose one bull from themselves, and cut it in pieces, and lay it on the wood, but put no fire to it. And I will prepare the other bull, and lay it on the wood, and put no fire to it. And you call upon the name of your God, and I will call upon the name of the Lord." And the God who answers by fire, he is God. And all the prophets answered, sorry, all the people rather answered, it is well spoken. So we have here a climactic point in Elijah's ministry, but it's also recorded here to show us Israel's history as a nation. What did they do at Mount Sinai centuries ago? They made a covenant with the Lord who brought them out of Egypt. They would have no other gods before them. They would not worship idols. But here they have grossly broken that covenant. And God mercifully sends Elijah. You know, this could be a point of revival for the northern kingdom. This could be an utter turning point for them. Elijah's assembled the teachers that have been telling them, God is not the one you should devote yourself to. Worship God, yes. Worship Yahweh, but you can worship Baal as well. Pray to God for these things. Thank him as you do in your festivals and so forth. But if you really need food, if you need provision, worship Baal. 
And Israel has to make a choice here. And God's going to seek to help them make the right choice. Yeah. Yeah, he's not limited to a certain locale. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My understanding is Mount Carmel has flip flopped uh, a fair bit. Uh, when Israel had more of the land, they used it for the high place, right? Um, but yeah, uh, with it being close to, to Sidon, uh, Tyre and Sidon, um, yeah, there was probably a lot of Baal worship going on. No, no. If, pagans thought if you're higher up on a mountain, you're closer to God. That's why you read about the high places. Um, that, that's what they were thinking. Yeah. So the scene is set here. And this is where Elijah really invites them. Okay, prove Baal is real. Call upon his name. And Elijah will call upon the name of Yahweh. Uh, so uh, we have here in verse 25, Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, Choose for yourselves one bull and prepare it first, for you are many, and call upon the name of your God, but put no fire to it. They took the bull that was given them, and they prepared it and called upon the name of Baal from morning until noon, saying, O Baal, answer us. But there was no voice, and no one answered. Okay, we want to notice this. How do these false prophets call upon the name of their God. This is where we have to get back to, to what this phrase actually means. To, to call upon the name of someone means that you are crying out to them for help. You are, you are looking to them as one greater than yourself to praise, to admire, to devote yourself to. And you're doing that because of who this person who this object of your devotion is what is their name you know what's in a name well when you read about a name in the scriptures it's not simply the sound of the letters of someone's name l-o-g-a-n for example for me it is talking about the character of that person the attributes of that person if you were to go and make a name for yourself what does that phrase mean? Well, it means you're going to show yourself for who you are. Uh, you're going to reveal your character in a wide scope. That's usually how that phrase goes. Uh, so to call upon the name of someone means that you're looking to them because of who they are and what they do. And these Baal prophets, they're calling upon the name of, of Baal. And look at how they do it. They cry out, O oh, Baal! Answer us. There was no voice. No one answered. They limped around the altar that they had made. You could also translate that as they, they danced. They, they, they put their bodies in motion in a ritual dance. And at noon, Elijah mocked them, saying, Cry aloud, for he is a god. Either he is musing, or he is relieving himself, or he is on a journey. Or perhaps he is asleep and must be awakened. Now the Baal prophets had a problem here because all those were real possibilities. <laughs> the way they believed their God was, all of those things could have been true. Now, Elijah mocks Baal for this. Because Elijah knows the one true living God who never falls asleep. God never has to go to the bathroom. God never leaves one place and now you can't talk with him because he's in another place. If you study who Baal is, Baal was one of the many gods that the Canaanites worshipped. He was the son of El and he had two wives, I believe. 
And uh, it was like a soap opera in, in heaven, essentially. Um, they were constantly fighting. He had to kill other gods. He had to do this. He had to do that. Much like a man would. Only he was very, very strong. That was their conception of deity. That's what they believed a god was. Much like themselves. You know, you think of Psalm 50, where God rebukes Israel. And he says, you thought I was one like yourself. Meaning, God's not like us. <laughs> God is above a lot of the things that we as creatures are having to do. Um, but of course, man making God in his own image, this is some of the best they can come up with. So Baal, um, he is worshipped as pretty much like a superhuman. You can imagine how that affects um, even their own living. Uh, we're going to get into uh, the, the beliefs of Baal and how they worship Baal because um, if, if you believe your God is, is, uh, is a womanizing, angry being, well, what's that, what, what are you going to do in your life, right? Uh, that's going to reflect on how you live your life and your morals as well. Yes, Zachary? What passage is Psalm, Psalm 50. Psalm. Yeah. Yeah, God rebukes Israel in that section there. Well, verse 28, it says that they cried aloud, they cut themselves after their custom with swords and lances until the blood gushed out upon them. And as midday passed, they raved on until the time of the offering of the oblation. But there was no voice, no one answered, no one paid attention. They cut themselves. They, they start to harm themselves. They do this because Baal is a god of power. He, he is a god who is a warrior. They do this to show how they're willing to submit to him in this twisted way. This is the, the problem of, of pagan religion. Really, all religion outside of, of the true religion from the Bible Man takes his own thoughts and desires and puts it into the religion. Makes a religion that will suit their own passions. And that's really what Baal and Ashtaroth worship was. Um, the way that they, they worshipped, as, as you just read, they have to cry out loud to get this God's attention. Because he might not hear them. They have to keep doing this so that they make sure... He knows that they're serious. Cut themselves up to make sure he knows they're serious. We're reminded of what the Lord Jesus said. What he instructs us in Matthew 6. How not to pray. Do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do. For your Father in heaven knows what you need before you ask him. As Pastor David opened up with that encouragement. In the pagan religions, that is simply not true. Keep talking. Keep explaining. Because this God needs to understand and maybe if you show enough seriousness, he might help you out. Uh, one of the ways they could help um, the, the gods was by doing perverted sexual acts. This is where the Asherah groves come in. Um, Asherah was the goddess and uh, the poles that they would set up, the groves that they would go to. There was all kinds of perversion uh, committed there. And they did this as a religious act. They did this thinking it was a spiritual thing. Because if they themselves committed these sexual acts, they thought it would stir up the gods in heaven, encourage them, strengthen them, so that they would bring fertility on the earth. So that is why you read how when Baal worship comes to Israel, so do the male cult prostitutes and the temple prostitutes. They make this... Something that they can not be ashamed of. They, they act as if it's a spiritual good thing. So many problems with this. What is underneath this? What's underneath every pagan religion? Well, it's, it's a desire to have those, those sinful longings fulfilled and still feel good about it. Ultimately, these Baal prophets, they weren't willing to repent. Even after they heard no voice, they weren't willing to turn to the one true living God. Their hearts were set on pleasure, on what they wanted, on power. 
They would have looked at Elijah, this man coming out of the bush. And they would have looked at themselves around Queen Jezebel's table. They weren't giving up Baal. They liked what Baal gave them. Pleasure, power. And what did Baal ask for? Not much. Holiness? Nope. Anything that would actually challenge their sinful hearts? Ultimately not. And that is ultimately why Israel loved bringing in Baal, but not the one true living God. We need to consider that for ourselves today. We live in a culture that does not worship the statue of Baal. We don't have any left. Um, you know, you find them in archaeological sites and so forth. But we are in a society that loves pleasure and power and will create worldviews or religions, just ways on how to view themselves and others, that will suit their own passions. What you have going on in the United States right now, whether it's from the police or the rioters, and there are some police, there are some protesters who have shaped their worldview based on what their sinful hearts want. Uh, they, they want power. I mean, both, both really want power at the end of the day. One, one gets the flack of having the power, so they look extremely bad, and you're not as, some people are not as sympathetic to them. Um, but there are many on both sides of, of an establishment or a minority where they think it's a power struggle. They want power. That's what they want. And so what will be done to get that power? Well, what's right in your own eyes? Um, you'll, you'll take in collateral damage. You'll do what you think is necessary. And you'll create a worldview to, to justify yourself while you do it. That's not true of this current event only. This is true about all of human history, ultimately. Yes, Zechariah, yes. You're, you're, you're compensating for everyone else. <laughs> go ahead, though. I did invite it, so go ahead. Yeah, no, I was, was going to get to the pleasure part, but you're, you're completely right. Yeah, yeah, no, there, there's a lot of complexities with it. You know, but what, what's the heart of it? Um, there, there's a strong desire uh, for, for the pleasure, for the power. Um, and, and that desire, unless it's checked by the gospel, real justice, real peace, it, it won't be had. Um, when we worship something other than God, when we ignore God and his ways, and we do what's right in our own eyes, that, that's where we're going to be led. Um, only what pleases ourselves. Uh, but God shows us a better way. He showed that uh, through the prophet Elijah here in Israel, and for time's sake, I, I can't continue. I know Pastor David's going to be praying uh, here soon, leading in the prayers. So maybe uh, next time we'll have to actually go into the prayer itself. Um, but we, we want to really consider that for ourselves as Christians. Uh, when we look at the Word of God, um, are we receiving God as He reveals Himself? What Israel wanted to do was worship God their own way, on their own terms, and have some of the world while they were at it. Um, they, they could have many gods. And now, many of us, all of us, I would trust, we would say, no, no, we can't have many gods. Never. No, of course. Well, you know, in a certain sense, Israel would, would say that too. They would say, yeah, no, we worship God, of course. But we also do these things. We also make these priorities. We also have these ambitions and so forth. Um, theirs was very public on display. Uh, we look back and we can clearly see their error. Well, we have to be careful for our own blind spots 
in our generation of Christianity today. There might come future generations of Christians and they look back and they say, yeah, th these people wanted to worship the Lord. And, and again, in many ways, um, their, their worship could be genuine, we as Christians today. But we were too caught up in this. We were too caught up in that. We prioritized money too much. We prioritized security in, in worldly thinking too much. Um, I think that we have a lot of temptations around us and we need to constantly examine my thinking, my planning, who I'm calling out to, where am I finding my trust? It needs to be in the Lord, and it should match up with, with how he's revealed that. Um, it should line up with his own character and what he does. To call upon his name means we are calling upon him in the way that fits his name, that fits who he is, right? Um, so I, I leave that with you, brothers and sisters. For, for time's sake, we won't uh, continue we want to make sure to give time for prayer. So, uh, Pastor David, you want to come on up, lead the prayers?